Good morning. Happy Easter if you're watching this on Easter and if you're not, happy Easter anyway. Here at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Salem and Unitarian Universalist Congregations in general, we believe that Easter is a time for everyone to celebrate. Whether you consider yourself a Christian, a Buddhist, a Jew, a Muslim, a Hindu, a, a free-range spiritual seeker, an agnostic, an atheist, a pagan, or something else, and there's a whole lot of else that could be added to this list. But you get the point. Everyone is invited to our Easter festivities, the joyful celebration of the rebirth of light and hope and joy and love in our lives. In our liberal religious tradition, we honor the religion of Jesus, especially his stirring example of all-inclusive love, rather than the religion about Jesus with its exclusionary doctrines and creeds. Our focus is on seeing Jesus in human terms and recognizing how this example serves to ignite the light of love and to bring out the best in all of us. We feel the same about other great saints and sages and seers from many traditions and even no traditions. The sources of our faith are boundless. During these times when there's too much isolation and loneliness, it's really important for us to find community. So I hope you find it here. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's good, it's good to have you. Our opening hymn this morning is We Sing of Golden Mornings. It's number 44 in the hymnal. she picked out? Thank you. So this comes from Langston Hughes. In the time of silver rain, the earth puts forth new life again. Green grasses grow and flowers lift their heads. And all over the plain the wonder spreads of life. Of life. Of life. In time of silver rain, the butterflies lift silken wings to catch a rainbow cry, and trees put forth new leaves to sing in joy beneath the sky. When spring and life are new again. Please join me in saying our affirmation. Love is our doctrine. Compassion is our way. Here we seek to create a joyful home for free religious exploration. Build a community of caring fellowship. Nurture the hopes and serve the needs of our world.
May the light of this congregation serve as hope to the world. Each week we light three chalices. The first for this congregation, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Salem. The second chalice we light for our partner church in Schimanfalva, Transylvania, Romania. And the third chalice we light for our children and youth in religious exploration and in our world at large. Blessed be. Today is Easter, and we have so much to be grateful for. I found a little poem to share with you called Free Verse Poem. The author is anonymous, so we'll thank them now for writing it, so we can share it with you this morning. Nature. It's a beautiful thing. We go outside, and it's right there. But we don't seem to notice it. With trees growing all around us, birds soaring in the air, flowers of many colors with sweet scents, animals resting in the shade, water flowing through rivers, lakes, seas, and oceans, fish swimming in the flowing water, forests growing high into the sky. We all must try to keep it so. It's a beautiful thing, nature. Let's just settle in for a second and be aware of the deeper rhythms of our life, what's going on around us in the world, how we can be a positive influence. This past Sunday, I was reading an article in the New York Times about the homeless population in, in Los Angeles, but it could just as well have been in our community because we certainly have plenty of homeless here ourselves. And in this article, various people without homes who were being interviewed and their stories um, were written in, there was a photo of them, these people, these good people living on the streets or in a riverbed or under a freeway or wherever. And one, one fellow who had a tent that he pitched under the freeway overpass <clears throat> talked about how he tries to sleep there but people many people too many people make it a point to honk their horns when they're going under the bridge but we live in a world where this happens where there are so many who lie wounded and and there are others who rub salt into the wounds it's it's it makes me so sad to think about this. And it just makes me aware of how much we are called to answer the call of compassion. It's not an optional thing in our world, I don't think, in the midst of our world where there's too much cruelty and callousness and indifference to the suffering of other people. I think that each one of us is called by the spirit of compassion. And so I'd like to invite you to consider how you can manifest cat compassion in your own life. Just pause for a second now and think about all those in your own life, your family, your friends, your neighbors, the community, our nation, the larger world. And think how you can answer the call of compassion in the unique way that you're capable of doing from where you live. I just invite us now to meditate for a second. As we consider how each one of us will answer the call of compassion in our lives. Compassion is our way.
and gratitude, gratitude. Our nation was founded, uh, inserted, I believe, in the Declaration of Independence was that we were supposed to pursue happiness. Uh, the pursuit of happiness was every person's right. And I have made a discovery, I, I dare say you made the same discovery, that the quickest and surest path to pursuing happiness is to be grateful for what you have, for what you have, really. We overlook so many of the blessings in our lives and only recognize them when they're gone. So perhaps this is a really good time for us to think about how gratitude can play a role in our life because we're missing some things and, and we're really grateful for them uh, and wish we could have them back. But while we can't have them now, let's, let's be grateful for the, the many things in our lives that enrich us all. Most especially today, I'm thinking about community here I am taping this service in, a, in my lonely office and the community is not around me and I really miss it. I really miss seeing you. But I'm so grateful to you, the members and friends of this congregation. I would invite you to reflect for a moment on what you're grateful for. Be grateful. Be happy. Amen. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child A long way from home A long way from home Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. A long way. A long way. Oh. Easter Prayer by Kathleen Rollins. Spirit of life, we come together this Easter morning to rejoice in the ongoing song of life that is within us and around us. In this season of renewal of life, bursting into bloom or song, the hidden beauty of nature preparing to unfold, remind us that we too have a hidden inner beauty, reflecting the image of your creative power. Yet, for all the beauty that lives in us and among us, we doubt its realization. We question our talent, our beauty, our abilities, our value. We become cynical about love, jaded about peace, less hopeful about the future. We roll stones across entrances, build fences instead of gates, close fists instead of open arms. 
Spirit of Resurrection, remind us of the power of hope to triumph over fear, the power of love to prevail over the horrors of hate, the potential for peace to be victorious over hostility. We pray for all that is still possible yet not yet fulfilled. Spirit of life, we feel you flowing and pulsing within. We pray for a courageous and joyous faith, empowering us to become our finest and truest selves, empowering us to see your image in our brothers and sisters empowering us to participate with you in the creation of a new time of life in which love, justice, beauty, and peace are abundantly available to all. May it be so. Amen. I can still remember my first impressions of Jesus. It came from a song my mother made sure I learned as a child. And it goes, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, be they yellow, black, or white. They are precious to his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. I was uh, living in a segregated society at the time, and that was, I think, the first, the only time I ever heard anything about all people being of, of equal worth. And the segregated, purportedly Christian society in which I was raised in Georgia didn't appear to share the same values, but the message I did get, uh, thanks to my mom, was that Jesus was not only a good guy, he was supernaturally great, and he loved all the children. That was good. And later when I attended Sunday school at the Southern Baptist Church, the lesson books, they were like graphic novels for youth that I really liked reading them. It was enjoyable. I, I didn't have to be told to read my Sunday school lessons. They made Jesus look like the neatest, bravest soul ever to walk the planet, even without, even without considering the miracles he performed. What wasn't to like about that? Well, here's what happened. As I entered my confusing adolescent years, I was struck by this realization, probably around 12 years old, I realized that Jesus probably wouldn't like me. After all, the preacher in the church I was forced to attend every Sunday when I would much rather have been elsewhere, they reminded us, the preacher that reminded us that Jesus had said, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. It's there, check it out. At that point in my young life, I assumed that Jesus' ideas of moral perfections were the same as those I heard from the pulpit. And it was a vision of perfection that seemed to drain the life and the joy out of all that made life worth living in the first place. And yet, deep down inside, I still felt guilty for not being that kind of perfect. Now, I, I wish there had been a Bible scholar around to tell me a couple of things. First, he would have said, you know, Jesus never said that. He couldn't have said it. This word perfect is a Greek philosophical concept. Uh, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and he would never have known that word. So the best that, uh, the closest approximation, if Jesus said this, was that uh, would be, instead of the word perfect, it would be the word whole. So be ye whole as your as God in heaven is, is whole or complete. That's, that's a much nicer rendering. But even so, even with that nicer rendering, most Bible scholars doubt that Jesus ever said any such thing at all anyway. Modern Bible scholars note that many of the words attributed to Jesus were later inserted by the later church to promote certain theological doctrines. But what I felt then, I didn't know any of this stuff then, I just felt that I wasn't perfect, and I never would be. And in my mind's eye, Jesus looked very disapprovingly down at me, so far, far, far from being perfect. And yet, even as I 
felt shunned and alienated but by what I imagined Jesus's judgmental attitude to be. As I entered my teenage years, I, I became pretty judgmental myself. I was a severe critic of the hypocrisy I witnessed in the Southern Baptist Church I attended. Even I even saw hypocrisy where it probably didn't exist. But judging from my small sampling in the, of the Southern Baptist Church in Columbus, Georgia, I concluded, I think I was about 15 or 16 years old, I concluded that all, all religion was a crutch for weak-minded, superstitious fools who couldn't, who couldn't face reality. Indeed, this attitude was an especially pronounced view among intellectuals near the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. They believed that science and technology was going to completely supplant religion and uh, talk about a naive faith. In the new burgeoning field of psychoanalysis during this time, uh, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries, uh, an international team of prominent psychoanalysts, they studied the scriptures, they read the Bible, and they determined that Jesus was a psychopathological character who was paranoid, crazy, delusional, and generally out of his mind to say and do the kinds of things he did uh, that the scripture said he did. Had I known about this diagnosis during my teenage years, I would have concurred. I would have said, yeah, that's right. Jesus is a nut. He's crazy. So anyway, I, I left religion behind, or so I thought, and it was it was bye-bye Jesus for me. I thought I was done with him. And then quite unexpectedly, quite unexpectedly, I encountered an entirely new spiritual acquaintance in my life, uh, the Buddha and Buddhism, Buddhist teachings. And this took me in some unexpected directions, including eventually back to Jesus. When I was in my early 20s, 21 years old, I think it was, I had some really powerful experiences. I, I would call them fleeting mystical experiences. They, they were probably not profound mystical experiences, but for me, they were. And I realized, I could sense it, that there was just so much more to the world's wisdom traditions than my arrogant teenage self had recognized. And I became especially interested in Eastern religion. And I joined a Buddhist community that was really, overall, it was a very positive experience very transformative experience for me. In those days, the counterculture was reshaping views on many fronts, and it was inevitable that Jesus, he had long hair, remember? At least according to the uh, famous images we have of Jesus. We actually don't have any idea how he looked, but the popular image of Jesus with the long hair and a beard, it was inevitable that some in the counterculture, especially when you understand a little bit about uh, the things that Jesus said and did, he, he, got, he became an ancient hippie for them. I can still remember, maybe you saw it too, that, that poster that shows Jesus looking like a hippie, a peacenik. He's smiling out there. Jesus was cool, at least for some. And I began to reconsider a little bit, but still Jesus was playing a very, very minor role in my spiritual life. So I had a job at a bookstore in San Francisco in those days, and one day I saw this book. I picked it up. It was entitled Mystics and Zen Masters. And I, I just started reading, and, and, and you know, sometimes these authors, they, I'm just instantly swept up by the graceful, deeply moving writing of the author. I wondered, well, I, I was curious, um, who was this author, Thomas Burton? Was, was he a Buddhist scholar? No, he wasn't. I was, I was really surprised, floored actually, to learn that this writer who was writing so appreciatively about Zen Buddhism was a Christian, a Trappist priest, Thomas Merton. Merton was one of the great souls of the past century who built bridges between religious traditions. At the end of his life, he was traveling in Asia. He was meeting up with Buddhists and Hindus and Jains. He was Unfortunately, he died in an accident in a, in a hotel in, in, in Thailand, and it was a tragic end to his life. He was 57 years old. He was a really, really great figure in our history. So if you ever want to do some good reading, I, I do heartily recommend Thomas Merton to you. I began reading all the books by Merton that I could lay my hands on, and I realized that my youthful rejection of all Christianity was based upon a very shallow, modern understanding of this deep and ancient tradition. 
And, and, and Merton's mystical reflections did not actually lead me back to Jesus directly, but his, his writing opened new doors of spiritual perception that enabled me to move in new directions. I remember this, I was especially moved by this poem that he wrote. He wrote this poem for his little brother who, who died in a plane crash in World War II around the Easter of 1943. It was the same time that Merton was entering the monastery. And this poem for my brother reported missing in action, 1943. It ends with these lines. For in the wreckage of your April, Christ lies slain and Christ weeps in the ruins of my spring. The money of whose tears shall fall into your weak and friendless hand and buy you back to your own land. The silence of whose tears shall fall like bells upon your alien tomb. Hear them and come, they call you home. That poem to his little brother who died in World War II. Just a, it's a touching poem, poem to me. And this image that Merton has in his poem calls to mind Mother Teresa who worked with the poor in India. And she's one of her quotes that she's famous for is, every day I see Christ in all his distressing disguises. Every day I see Christ in all his distressing disguises which calls to mind the passage from Matthew 25, 40. Whatsoever you do unto those whom the world regards as the least of these, my brothers and sisters, he did it to me. He did it to me. Did Jesus utter those sublime words? Honesty compels me to acknowledge that Bible scholars say he didn't, probably but I think he would have given his seal of approval to this one, to this quote. And so I came to see Jesus as that sacred presence within every person, just as the, in the Hindu tradition, they say that the Atman, the sacred dwells with each one of us and the same as the Buddhists proclaim that everyone has Buddha nature. I know this is at heretical odds with traditional Christian theology, but it works well for me. In fact, maybe because I was raised in a Christian culture, the idea of seeing Christ in everyone has, has spiritual power for me. It lights me up, this passage, whatsoever ye do unto those whom the world regards as least, you have done unto me, the sacred one. This image strums the deepest chords of my heart. It's with me a lot of times when I'm looking at people, especially the people that I think Jesus would want to minister to. But, you know, quite honestly, Jesus still didn't factor in that much with my spiritual life, my Eastern religious perspective. And here's an odd thing. When I, when I look back on my official theological education at a mainstream Christian school of theology, where I was usually the only resident Unitarian Universalist heretic, I, I realized as I look back on my education that we hardly spend any time at all talking about Jesus. Jesus, the human being. The emphasis was on the religion about Jesus, the Trinitarian doctrines and creeds, which I could just never get on board with those. They never, they never personally struck me as credible or, or helpful for many, many people. It may be helpful for some people, but certainly not for everyone. And to insist that you have to adopt those creeds to appreciate Jesus is not something that I accept. Don't get the wrong impression about theology school. It was, a, it was a really great experience. It was not a waste of time. I was especially struck by the scholarly rigor and the integrity they showed in, in revealing to us how the ancient scripture that eventually came to be known as the Bible evolved into being. It was sort of like a, sort of like a visit to the sausage factory, really. It's, it's actually uh, quite an quite a interesting story, the patchwork quilt that we call the Bible, how that came into being. And I was intrigued by this, but some of my fellow Trinitarian Christian students, that was a jolt for them to learn that the Gospels had, had all sorts of inconsistencies and that the early church put in a whole lot of words into Jesus's mouth. They did, especially in the Gospel of John. 
Modern scholars generally affirm that as sublime as Jesus's words in this gospel might be, they didn't come from him. And in fact, many of the harshest judgmental pronouncements attributed to Jesus came from some later source who used Jesus's identity to affirm the church's beliefs and doctrines. So my theological education was not especially serving to enamor me of Jesus. And then near the end of my theological studies, my Master of Divinity degree, I, I took this class in something called liberation theology. I didn't know what that was, liberation theology. And it was taught by a, a professor from South America, Jose Miguez Bonino. He came from a part of the world where the poor were oppressed by the elite and, and raped and murdered by the military government. Just, he'd, he'd known about some really terrible things. And now's not the time for a tutorial in liberation theology. Suffice it to say that Dr. Benigno helped me recognize that Jesus was somebody who really got down into the dirty, dangerous trenches of life. He met the poor and the oppressed where they were. He went where love and compassion were most needed, even if his liberating message of radical love was seen as subversive by the authorities, and, and this certainly placed him in danger. So just as Thomas Merton's image of the Christ residing in every person that deeply touched and transformed me, so did Bonino's image of Jesus as the one who was drawn to those whom the world oppressed and despised that Jesus especially ministered to those, it was profoundly moving to me. Indeed, this is really, I think, what has motivated me to become involved in the immigrant justice movement here in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest. I, I have recognized our own government's treatment of immigrants is, as being unconscionably cruel and unjust. I especially think about the damage that's been done to children who have been separated from their parents. And this was done by our government. And that's why I'm out there fighting this, fighting against this cruelty by our government. Becoming involved in this movement is more than political activism. For me, it's a spiritually grounded activism. And I'm profoundly grateful to the Interfaith Movement for Immigrant Justice because this organization, which I belong to, provides a way for me and for our congregation to be involved in this work, meaningfully engaged so that we can actually make changes. So over the course of my spiritual journey, my inner Rembrandt has painted a pretty sublime image of Jesus in my heart. It's an image I see whenever I look closely and lovingly at another person. And yet still, Here's a question that just naturally arises. This Jesus, is, isn't, isn't that just a, a projection that I've created? In truth, the more I've studied the life and ministry of Jesus, the more I've realized how remote and unknowable and inaccessible the historical Jesus is. At the conclusion of his classic work, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, Albert Schweitzer noted that he, Jesus, comes to us from of old as one unknown, an ineffable mystery. He lived so long ago, the records are so slight, and even as we learn more about the historical Jesus, the more we realize that our knowledge will always be fragmentary and incomplete. So, yeah, I think you could. I think you could say that the image I have of Jesus is disconnected from the real historical Jesus who lived so long ago. But here's the mystery of this. Why are we, why is humankind so compelled to enshrine great souls in our spiritual imaginations, those shining examples of goodness and compassion and wisdom, Jesus the Christ, the Anointed One, Buddha, the compassionate one, the awakened one, Muhammad, the prophet, peace be upon him. Why do we do this? I think we have to do it. I think it's because our deepest, truest nature calls for us to embody, to envision embodied examples of the highest and holiest values that dwell within all human hearts. 
we create such examples because we need such examples, such spiritual stars who shine in the heavens of our spiritual imaginations to show us the way, the path to joy and freedom and love. Today is not Easter Sunday for me, because I'm taping this ahead of the time, but I hope you're watching this on Easter. This is a day when many around the world, it's, it's a different celebration during this pandemic when we can't get out and be together, but still many people around the world are celebrating Jesus's literal resurrection. And, and I honor, I honor those who hold that belief, even if it's not mine. But what I recognize and celebrate today is this deep spiritual truth. In spite of all the cruelty and the hate and the greed in our world, love continues to appear and to reappear, to be reborn again and again. We can't stop it out. And I think that tells us something profound and wonderful about ourselves about this amazing and wondrous life we share, especially during this time of crisis in our lives when the clouds of fear hover above us. It's good to remember that the light of love shines always, even when we can't see it. Happy Easter to each and every one of you. We take the light from our chalice, lighting the social justice candle as a symbolic reminder of the light and justice we carry out in the, into the world. Remember, go your ways, not knowing all the answers to all things, yet seeking always the answer to one more thing than you know. Christine Ertl, Chair of the Board here. Once again, I'm going to give you our stewardship campaign update. We here at UUCS are a community of care, now even more so at this disorienting time. Our congregation has stepped in to support each other and the greater Salem community in so many ways during this pandemic. We put out a great call 
to check in with all our congregants through teams, committees, and individually. We've contributed financially to congregants in need. We've offered our fellowship hall to families of essential workers and first responders, and we're making masks for our hospital workers. This is all due to our current financial status because members and donors have contributed annually to this campaign. These are likely people you know and care about, and they were motivated to give to the church in the first place. Now, more than ever during this pandemic, we recognize the value of community and the blessings of our, our beloved congregation. Many of you have already asked how you can be of help during this pandemic. Well, contributing to the pledge campaign may not be what you thought the answer would be. Our campaign has brought us a long way toward meeting our goal, and thanks to all of you who have participated. But we have a bit more distance to go, and I'm asking for your help. I'm asking those who can to contribute even more. We know many of our congregants are not in the financial position to do so at this time. But I know those of you who are able to add more to your pledge will be grateful for the opportunity to be of service to others, offsetting the need to ask our most vulnerable congregants to do so. Here's the bottom line. We need $20,000 to meet our goal of keeping staff, shared ministry, and programs running. How to do this? Specifically, if 200 congregants increase your annual donation by $100, which equals less than $10, or two lattes per month, we would reach this goal. Our Unitarian Universalist congregations are communities of service that strengthen the social fabric of the places we call home. Your contribution is one way to maintain this social fabric. Our congregation is filled with thoughtful, caring people. Let's continue to demonstrate that through our increased pledges. So if you haven't signed an estimate of giving form, I urge you to do so. If you've already submitted this form, you can add to it to increase your pledge. You can get this form online at uusalem.org or by calling or sending an email to the office. Thank you. Our closing hymn today is Now the Green Blade Riseth. It's number 266 in the hymnal. So we can't join hands today to say our closing words. We, we can't place our hands on one another's shoulders either, but we can hold one another in each other's hearts as we say our closing words. Would you please join me as we say those closing words? May, May faith, faith in the, in the spirit, spirit of life, life hope for the, for the community, community of earth, and, and love for the sacred in one, one another, another be ours now 
and, and in all the days to come. To come. 